let me tell you about a little bit about this particular exhibition. Uh, we um, are launching a series called Mumbai as a City of Knowledge. And uh, the idea is to look at the archiving and research about the city that is done uh, in collaboration with various knowledge producers here and to exhibit that creatively and to invite dialogue and debate on that issue um, from all of you and other and, and broader audiences. So this is the first of that series to go public. So I want to start off by um, welcoming Nandita Das. I know everybody knows her through her films. I mean, she's been in, um, you know, opened our eyes to through her portrayals, through through the roles that she did, and through the through that 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 cinema world to all kinds of new realities and pushed our boundaries on that. Whether it's through um, you know fire or earth, and even her stage performances. So, Good evening, everyone. It's a nice, intimate gathering, and I think all of you know probably more about what's happening here at the center or at Pokar, so I'm probably talking to friends, new friends. Um, I have informally known Pokar for a long time, since Anita has been involved with it. And um, in 2008, I was at the graduation ceremony of their Barefoot Researchers. And I was absolutely amazed by the work they had done. They all had different stores, apart from the interactions. I went to each of their stores where they explained the work they were doing. One has often wondered that, you know, we talk about knowledge, as, you know, the city as a knowledge base. Well, where do we really get our knowledge? Our knowledge is so processed in a way. Our knowledge is so second-hand. Our knowledge is often so top-down that we seldom get the opportunity to actually hear it from the people who have lived it, who have actually seen it with their own ears. It's from, from within. And even in cinema, you know, we often say that films are seldom made from within. It's an outsider looking at somebody's life or a particular community. And that's why cinema also that sees from within has a different gaze. And I remember in 2008 when I walked through all of those stalls, what really struck for me was that I wasn't listening to a story told by someone about someone else, but people were telling their own stories, their own journeys were being shared how they had been following things, how they had been researching, what were their learnings, how did they contribute. I think the giving and receiving was so simultaneous that it was a different kind of knowledge that we seldom get to hear or read or even meet such people. So I think it was a very special experience. And through her, I've been, of course, getting to know more about what Pokar does, what these barefoot researchers do, how they evolve, what, I mean, how we get to understand their work and they, this urbanization that we talk about, it's like a big monster. And they, the people who are actually living, who inhabit the city, are increasingly becoming invisible. And I think what Pokard has really been consistently doing is to bring out their stories through their own experiences and truly collaborative and from within. And I think that's, and research has always been undermined, it's seen as an academic thing. And when you do not belong to a proper big university, it's not academic enough. You kind of fall between two spaces. So I think to recognize organizations like Pukar, who do truly uh, this kind of research that comes from the ground level up, which influences policies, civil society organizations, even media, so that we get together right stories is so important. And the collaboration between Columbia, the center, what's it called, the global Center and Pokar is an ideal partnership because to be able to follow these things for seven years and to the exhibition that we saw, the website, because finally you can do great work, but if it doesn't reach out, it again, you know, it's sort of a lot of effort gone wasted. So I think this collaboration is excellent. It's only very recently that I've become a trustee of Pokar, so I think I'll be more formally involved. and. Uh, the fact that that organization recognizes the intermingling of social aspects, political, cultural, all of these, which have been pretty much straight jacketed, and there's seldom those spaces where they can interact. And I think with your collaboration, all of us will get a chance to see where these different streams really meet. So thank you very much, Ravina and Anita, and both the organizations calling me here, because sometimes when you're not called as a guest, you want to be in such events, but you know, you somehow get too caught up in your own world. And now that I'm directing this film called Manto and I'm in the post production, 
So you have to also be friends of people because then you can't say no to them and, and thank you therefore to invite me. Thanks. Mumbai became a world capital because of the world's hunger for coffee. Remedy supplied by Giran Gaon, the village of Mills, located in the heart of Mumbai. Now the industry has moved elsewhere, and the working class has been excluded from a glass and steel version of the future. Mumbai's blue collar heart is breaking. That cities can thrive on dreams alone is a myth. Mumbai embodies urban ecosystems around the world. Who gets to live there and how? This is the story of Kiranga. not just the affluent and the people with voices that they have a right to the city. Everybody who contributes to the economy of the city has a right. We are in a fast track of underdevelopment because more and more people are being marginalized. They are being pushed out. If you take the total open space and divide it by the population, you get one square meter per Mumbai per. Redevelopment of Chai, Hamari Chalso Jai, Eki Uske Sar Hamloko Kyaman Nevala. The development is becoming more and more exclusive rather than being inclusive. That remains to be the biggest challenge of Mumbai City's development, its future, and the kind of trend of urbanization that India is witnessing at this moment. Some of you might not have heard that. Um, Anita and uh, the Pukar team had been working for seven years documenting what was happening in the Midlands from a people's perspective. And um, uh, Helm Studios joined them to, in the, in the last two years, I think the last three years, they were part of the project um, that the Ford Foundation had commissioned. And uh, with the idea of bringing this knowledge that they had uh, you know, documented into the public domain and they were um, you know, just amazing technologically and amazing in terms of their understanding and their humanity and I thought it was a great match and so the Pukar team uh, with Helm has uh, you know, worked really hard to create this exhibition and I hope you will get to see more aspects of that. So I'm just going to um, you know, ask a few questions and uh, uh, hear from our panelists and uh, then open it up to you all for, for, um, for questions. <coughs> so I'm going to start with you, Neera. And uh, you have, of course, been uh, a leading expert, one of the first you know, writing on the mill area, bringing it to, uh, to academic attention as well. So um, tell us, I mean, not everybody here might know about some of the key aspects of um, you know, the, the transformation that was happening to the city as a result of the redevelopment of the midlands. So what would you say were some of the key ways in which urbanization of Mumbai has been affected by um, the deregulation in some ways of the midlands? Well, we have to see this, I think, in the context of the, uh, the whole uh, change in economic policy of the government. And uh, that has contributed a lot. I mean, there are many reasons why the uh, mills had to close down. Of course, there were some of the government policies regarding the uh, textile, textile policies. Then, uh, uh, many people want to blame uh, the strike of 1982 and Datta for it, but it is not true. Uh, there's nothing, nothing, as you all know, a black and white about any, you know, any history. And when we were doing this book, that is one thing we realized that uh, you know a same because we, we decided to give voice to the people here. 
and uh, in living in Kerala, and especially their struggles, because the whole identity of the mill lands is through the struggles. So, uh, and then there are many points because nothing, as I said, there are so many grey areas. The same event, the same say any event, whether it is uh, in the national struggle or the class struggle or, or cultural resistance. And there are many ways in which the people of Kingaranga actually fought <coughs> against the establishment, so to say, and to the colonial leaders and, uh, of course, the, uh, the capitalist policies. Uh, so, so this struggle, this whole militancy, which is which has come through the history, we see reflected in various phases. So if you are talking about this, uh, the phase which is post-globalization and when this whole skyline started changing, uh, it, is, it is due to many reasons. And uh, uh, one of the important reasons is the, because the, uh, you know, the, the financial capital was taking different forms that this uh, uh, closing down the mills for the mill owners, the closing down the mills and the opening for real estate development was much more lucrative. And uh, then there was a struggle uh, against this. Now the most important <coughs> aspect of this struggle which was post-91 and that is where what we are, we are, we are addressing the people here uh, and which we have not included in our book because we were very much part of that struggle so we didn't know how to write. We thought if we didn't write another book which has not happened. But, uh, that's where the, the, the struggle was not limited to the textile milk industry because that was affecting the entire city. And I have to mention here that the, 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 the new, new movement of the mill workers was also taking a different shape. And it was not the old uh, struggle which, you know, where people would come out on the street and then they would, you know, protest. Here there was an, another aspect of a constructive resistance. Which means when this one third, you all know about this one third, right? You know, from this uh, diagrams that in 91, or, you know, due to government policies, the entire mill land was supposed to be divided into three parts: one part for the mill owner, one part for the city's open spaces and amenities, and the third part was for public housing. So that entire uh, formula was changed by some very uh, surreptitious. Uh, intervention by the bureaucrats, the nexus of the bureaucrats, politicians and the mill owners. And the whole um, percentage of these public amenities and open spaces came down from 30% to 8% and 6% and so on. So now there was a struggle against this and the um, most uh, fascinating part of the struggle was not only the mill workers, but the entire you know spectrum of the civil uh, society movement actually participated in it. So we had this Mumbai People's Action Committee, where people, <coughs> the slum dwellers and the environmental, very upper class environmental organizations who were talking only in terms of beautiful Bombay and clean Bombay and slumless Bombay and so on, they had to sit together with the slum dwellers and there was a lot of interaction. And there was a struggle against uh, uh, the court decision and uh, on the street and I, I must say that the struggle is still going on because even what is the minuscule percentage for housing and open spaces has not been surrendered by either the private mill uh, owners or the uh, government mills. So uh, it's on and uh, just to underline that, that the, the struggle and this issue is not limited to the textile mill lands, but it is the, <coughs> and, and the struggle also came, uh, you know, the trajectory is from the mill gates to the neighborhood, because first time when the Phoenix uh, uh, discothic and the bowling alley came up, the people from the Gerangar said that, look, this is not what we want. If the mills have to close down, this is not what we want, and we want another, you can have, you know, we have skilled hands, so we want some other industry, it could be high tech, low polluting, whatever, but we don't want the, uh, you know, the, the discothic here. And that's where the uh, cultural resistance movement was again revived. The earlier cultural movement was during the Shahi Ramar Sheikh and Bhargat Sahani and Ipta and everything. Now, this was a new uh, resistance movement where 
people from the middle class Bombay also joined this. So we have Anand Kathwardhan to Parmita Mora and uh, other actors like Vipran Gokhale and all coming, sitting right outside the Phoenix Mill, you know, and resisting it. And uh, this so then appeal was made to the neighborhood that look, it's not only the mill, mills, but it is for you as well. And the third step was talking about the city. That this is this is the struggle is again not limited to Biranga, but it is the struggle for the city and because of new policies, the, uh, the way urbanization was happening, that you require to come together. And this is, did happen. In a way, it's a lost battle, but I wouldn't put it that way because still the mill workers have got their own housing. However, you know, um, difficult it is to actually get it implemented. Um, and secondly, this, uh, you know, this form of a joint movement was something unheard of earlier. And this actually took place and uh, I guess <laughs> it will happen again. Thanks, Dira. <coughs> it's very interesting as an architect, right, that you were also in some ways documenting uh, this movement. So could you tell us a little bit about how architectural practice must reflect these histories? What should it reflect these histories? <coughs> Has it reflected these histories? <laughs> Well, architecture in general. Uh, architecture in the city. I mean, you as an architect, right? How do you get involved in the in the movement, and how do you see your own documentation affecting your practice? Let's put it, bring it home. Um, well, I uh, I'm as an urban we got into it after this 1991 policy, which came up of one third, one third, and. Uh, uh, we had many friends in the very Kankar Sangarsha Samiti, the the mill union, and they wanted us to tell us about more about this, you know, the pros and cons, and whether they should uh, accept it, whether they should resist, whatever. So uh, we helped them bring out the booklet in English and in Marathi, and uh, this is how we got them, and then we just became part of it. So it was like being part of the union. Uh, so, in a way, the entry point was through our profession as architects. <coughs> and we, uh, and many of us, we don't see architecture only as good looking buildings or iconic buildings. Architecture cannot be divorced from the, the, you know, the social layer, the cultural layer, uh, the economic layer, the political layer. And uh, then if, if I consider myself as a part of this entire, in the environment, then I can't say that I will only look at my the buildings I and I will not question this whole redevelopment policy or I will not question the closure of the mill lands. But it's not very easy to implement this. You know, it's it, it, it's very difficult. So uh, and as we were seeing that this that the future of the mills in the 90s, uh, late 90s also the future was quite clear. So Mina, who Mina and I were part of this, Mina was of course from the earlier uh, <coughs> union movement and I had joined in the 90s. But we realized that this needs to be documented in some way. So what are the ways to document? <coughs> we could have just <coughs> you know, sat and written the history and then <coughs> moving ahead and so on, or a lot of pictures and so on. But we thought that let the history come out from the people. You know, so in a way, we thought we'll give voice to the people and cross section of the society, which is male workers, men and women. Then we have, um, uh, you know, the leaders, the the cadre, the artists, the uh, performing artists, then Rangoli artists, then the women who ran Khana walls, and you know, many Gaukari mandars and so on. So this kind of gave us a very rich tapestry and. Also, we, it was of course very enlightening for us, but we also realized that uh, you know just one any one event can have different points of view. Which means when a when a act, a mill worker activist is talking about her experience of a certain strike, this can be contradicted by her own leader because there's a certain image which the leader wants to project, but the activist doesn't have that you know uh, that compulsion. So this is what we learned. We, we I mean, we just gave a context to the entire, you know, all the testimonies and all the voices we had. 
uh, but this became an important exercise. But as an architect, what I learned from here, and this is what when we are talking to the students, we always try to convey that this neighborhood, it was not just textile mills and the jobs. You know, the whole neighborhood which was which came together as an integrated development, it was not planned. It was not zoning, private zone, separate, public zone, separate, industrial zone. This is what we learned in our college that you should have different zoning in, in a city. But here, because there was no zoning, you find such a rich neighborhood here where the, the place to live and the place to work is so, so much in proximity that large number of women could participate in the struggles. You know, and the, the, the women of um, uh, the mill area or the mill worker women are, are known for their militancy. And if you read some of the testimonies, I mean, they have no, no bars at all, the way they would fight and scream and how they would, you know, uh, spawn. So, uh, so one way is the participation of women in the public, in not only the wage labor market, but in the public uh, sphere. Uh, also, you know, various infrastructure. If you see today, Hiranga, there are at least eight or ten local railway stations. You know, Harbour Line, Central Line, Western Line. Okay, there are best of the hospitals, KEM, Wadia, Tata Hospital and so on. Then the main uh, north-south arterial roads go through that. There are lovely open spaces, not just huge parks, but even smaller <coughs> open spaces in the neighborhoods. And this entire thing, you know, is offered on platter to these new real estate developers. You know, because it's a, and that's why this was, which was a very stereo, stereotype kind of a neighborhood. <clears throat> Meaning, I remember in my childhood it was like, oh, don't pass through Paril and Lalba. If you have to go to the other from Marine Lines, you better go via Marine Lines or Marine Drive. Because it was very, I mean, a lot of social prejudices that this was uh, mill workers, meaning alcoholic, communists, fighters, you know, I mean, uh, illiterate and so on and so forth. But as we, as who have also realized because we belong to middle class and that's why this is a learning experience for, for us. That when we interact, you realize that you know the whole history of struggle, I and mean, there's so much to learn from there. Because the whole perspective is the, the perspective to which they are looking at the society is very different from ours. And so architecturally as urban planning, I think this is a great lesson to learn. Yeah. Great. I mean, I hope there's a, we have a lot of uh, you know, people from architectural colleges. Of course, architectural universities and colleges have, have mushroomed in the city since the midlands also were redeveloped, right? And it's part of that uh, availability of real estate that calls for a demand of architects and has and a lot of young people who are inspired by work that is, you know, that is uh, inspired by knowledge that is evoked through um, researching and understanding different perspectives, find it very, very difficult and find it, uh, you know, when they're actually putting into practice, when they're actually being contracted, when they're actually signing, that they cannot um, express what they have learned through research uh, onto their practice. And the practice then doesn't create a space for alternative experiments and this kind of, um, you know, a shared space that perhaps was a prevalent and, and perhaps what they know. So it's created a dissonance in some ways in the field of architecture, I would say, very strongly, and we can discuss that more. But um, staying on the subject, since you evoked it, um, you know, of what it means to understand this whole movement from the perspective of the people who live there. Um, Anita, I want to turn to you um, and ask you about the methodology and the research, you know, um, the research that you um, have uh, as, a, as, a, as a representative of Pukar, what is the methodology that you found most useful to work with in understanding uh, this particular region? So I think I will pick up two very critical words from Mira's uh, dialogue, and they are uh, the struggle that <coughs> most people live through and the transformation that happened in the city. So the methodology we have used in Pokhara over the last 12 years is basically based upon Professor Arjun Apadrai's seminal essay called Right to Research. 
Now, Professor Arjun Napadurai is actually a founder trustee of Uttar, and he's a very renowned anthropologist, like the Vina. Um, and uh, in his essay, he essentially documented the virtue of doing research by community-based youth. So this is basically democratizing research. So you can't give a prerogative only for people who are sitting in an academic institutions. But anybody who is living in the communities, who has a huge amount of indigenous knowledge located in the community, can do this research as long as they are trained with those skills. And this way, democratizing research, uh, accepting multiple epistemologies of knowledge production, accepting the fact that knowledge is located in the community, challenging the profile of the researcher. So most of my colleagues who are sitting here who have done seven years of long, hard work on this, none of them are anthropologists, sociologists, architects, none of that. They are basically uh, youth who is living in the Charles actually Shrutika and uh, Pratiksha live in that Raju Kamati Chaw that we get to see of, uh, later. So they lived in Girangao and the idea was to train youth who was living in that place to train them to give them the skill of research so that they can then talk to the people. Now it was very easy for Shutika and Tejal and Kiran to go and talk to their neighbors, to their uh, uh, relatives. All of them were connected to the Girangao and the male textile mill area to their parents, their grandparents, to their families. So it was very easy for them to go and get the narratives of the people within their community. And we strongly believe, like our community, that those kind of narratives which are coming from the community voices, now if, if, if those narratives have the nuances and the granularity, that perhaps an academic who is parachuting on the community may never be able to get. And that is the basic uh, beauty of this methodology. Yeah, I, I want you to talk a little bit about, thank you, I want you to you know, just reflect a little bit about what was the new things that they learned? I mean, it's one thing that they knew, you know, uh, Shrutika Olip and Pratiksha, you knew about your own families and you knew about your neighbors. How did research enable you to understand the community that you didn't know better? What were some of the new learnings that research opened up for them? So I, I can share some of the stories I have heard from other bedroom researchers. So Kritika told me that when we started researching our own communities, so said this group Delhi was right behind my, my, uh, my troll. And I have always seen these women working there. But when I put the lens of a researcher and started talking to them and getting their histories, we, they all suddenly realized the richness of the heritage their communities had. And I think that to them was a big learning. It also was important for them to take pride in it. Because you know, many a times, like Hira said, oh, you cannot travel through Virangao because they are mill workers, they are low class, they are this, they are that. That kind of a shame that they had uh, imbibed growing up. That shame got transformed into a pride that, no, actually we have a rich heritage. We have a lot of things to uh, uh, be proud about. So that was a huge transformation in their own sense of identity. Because when Girangam started transforming from the biggest struggle, all these barefoot research, just like everybody else in the community, went through was this sense of identity. Because their identity, which was located in Girangao, connected to the textile mill industry, connected to the various art forms, the cultures, the festivals, the people, that he was being transformed. And their struggle with the identity was the strongest and the deepest. So it was that identity revival that also happened to them through research. Yeah, it's interesting because we were talking earlier and we were um, looking at the way in which the gaze of research in some ways, you know, takes a subject and even when it gives it voice, so to say, it's about understanding it from the perspective of autobiography. Yes, you can have a voice, but only tell us your own story, right? So in 
that sense, you, there is somebody else outside who's not, you know, belongs to different kinds of circuits of power who can analyze, who can have a sweeping gaze and can actually compare and analyze and do the research. Whereas the, the so-called subject from these areas is always trapped in a mode of internal autobiography, only talking about themselves. So what I think was really powerful about this project was the ability to, in, of turning that ethnographic gaze and also asking questions and learning to ask those questions differently and doing that research deeply and um, not being only in the space of that autobiography. Of course, it was about the community, but I think it exposed them to new um, areas of investigation, even in that community, and it made that very familiar space very strange, uh, which is often the methodology of anthropology as well. So I think this was what Arjun had, um, had actually theoretically argued for, but practically, I mean, I think all of you were challenging anthropology in that sense and saying not just the passive subjects, but really inquiring subjects, right? So, um, and, and collaborators in the production of knowledge. Um, I'll go back to some questions about research and the methodology uh, of Kukar much more. I'm going to turn a little bit to the exhibition, you know, and uh, the desire to, to collect, to make this an archive, you know. Um, so, why, why document and why make this an archive and why do this, you know? Uh, so to, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the process of archiving? So we actually went through seven long years of archiving. Uh, this project was uh, supported uh, by uh, Ford Foundation and then our youth fellowship program was supported by the Kanka Trust over 10 years. So we evolved this methodology over uh, long. But during those and during the <coughs> seven years of our support, I think that time Ravina was Ford Foundation's program officer, so she was a integral part of this entire project. So, why was the reason for archiving? Uh, because I think the transformation was happening in Giranga, and uh, many of my barefoot researchers who actually did the research, they all were struggling through this. Uh, uh, are we going to be here? Are we going to be transformed somewhere? Are we going to be dispossessed? Are we going to be shifted? Uh, do we have to change our neighborhoods? So that was one area of struggle. The second area of struggle or importance of archiving was that everybody thought that this was the heritage which was built by a working class over a period of 100 years and it was suddenly going to be erased out. And this was a critical part of Mumbai's history and Bombay's identity. So I think mill workers had contributed hugely, not economically, but also socially and culturally to the identity of the city. And I think we all felt that it was critical that this particular uh, contribution <coughs> made by the working class neighborhood over a period of 100 years suddenly it seemed to be coming to an end and as if nothing of this was going to be remaining. The other uh, important thing was that and I think we decided to archive it and then we thought, oh, but we need to make it into some sort of a museum. And at that point in time, uh, we got uh, in touch with uh, Mrugul and Rajan. Uh, they had seen the Tenement Museum in New York. We had talked about it and then they decided that, okay, we are going to help you archive it, but just archiving it is not going to happen or help if we cannot disseminate it largely to a larger, not just audience in this city, but audience everywhere, globally. And I think it was their design, their technology, and their skills, and their passion, all four of them equally important, that came through this archival process and created this beautiful exhibition. And more interesting is the interactive uh, site that I would request all of you to go and visit. Um, just um, thank you, thank you, Anita. Just to linger on the archive and the <coughs> sites of cultural production, Raziel, I'm going to turn to you as well because this, uh, you know, just from reading your work, understanding a different context altogether. Um, I, I want, so you are looking at the relevance of these sites of cultural production and in some ways the archive also in the technological era. So what are the forms in this technological era 
are we, what, where is, who owns the contemporary? Um, well, um, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me in this great exhibition. This is my first day in Mumbai, so I am uh, very, very impressed for the city and, the, and the, uh, this um, exhibition uh, helped me to understand a little bit more. Um, my, uh, my research is uh, based on uh, the shanty towns in Latin America, in Japan, so in Latin America, in Argentina, and Brazil. And uh, that is important, yet, so maybe you Oh, can okay. Yeah. Um, uh, my research is focused on uh, the, the humanitarian projects in the shanty towns in Argentina and Brazil, the favelas in Brazil, the villas in Serias, uh, the slums in uh, Argentina, in Buenos Aires, um, Buenos Aires and Rio, Argentina and Brazil, and um, the, 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 this, this kind of slang uh, were um, built in the, uh, during the 20th century, uh, around the 20th century. But in, the, in 2001, a very, very deep crisis um, and exposed a lot of people from the system uh, to, the, to, the, to, to the slums. So uh, they, they um, where um, the, the slums grow, growing up uh, uh, rapidly. So um, I, I, I am interested in this kind of project uh, to, to preserve the identity, to preserve the, the history of the uh, people and uh, to integrate uh, the, the slums in the city because as you say um, the, the, the slum is not an island, it's part of the city and part of the city. <coughs> so um, I focus in two, two projects uh, in Buenos Aires. Uh, one of them is uh, an, an alliance between um, the, the, the people of the slum and, uh, the, the, and some art. The artist um, looking for um, homeless children could pick up um, uh, pick up board in the, in the trash and um, make a publishing house. But the publishing house uh, made, uh, I, I have a book because maybe uh, it's easy to understand. Um, this, this kind of, of project, the, the children uh, pick up the, the cardboard and then um, they... So right, because you got that, right? Uh, they, 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 the very prestigious artists, uh, very prestigious um, uh, writers, um, Offer the, their uh, <coughs> work, and this um, this project consists in a big big library about uh, the more avant-garde uh, writers in Argentina and Latin America, and the uh, children, the homeless children who design the the, the, the cover and the the. the Copy the, the text and uh, what uh, on the, uh, the, the the books. So um, I, uh, this this kind of, of project is um, a connection, very interesting connection to me because uh, the children, uh, that children, uh, are connected not just um, um, with the uh, culture in general, but with the most sophisticated part of the, of the um, literary field. So uh, they, <coughs> they 
the color access uh, so um, to to different uh, kind of um, uh, um, knowledge. So uh, I I am, I am very interested in this um, kind of project that is contemporary because they have a very interesting website also, but. The materiality, the, the the real material of the everyday uh, material, uh, the pick up the the, the cardboard, uh, the clean the the, the cardboard. Uh, uh, it's, it's interesting because they preserve the uh, original uh, cardboard, and so uh, you have the history of the. Uh, the, the material, no, the, it's a commercial. Um, this is a box, commercial box. It's a, um, some cookies, and then the the people uh, like crash, and then the, the the children pick up the the cardboard, and then the artist with the children and the books. So this is. Um, kind of contemporary, but the, 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 the connection with the present because um, they, they have a website and they, make, uh, they sell the, 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 the books in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the website and um, well, uh, this, this is uh, one project, a very, very successful project because it started in Argentina in 2001 and uh, was uh, exported to Latin America. There are uh, uh, publishing cardboard publishing houses in all the countries in Latin America: in Bolivia, Peru, Mexico, Brazil, Chile, um, and so on. Um, and the other project is uh, is uh, different. Um, um, uh, one um, artist went to the slum in Buenos Aires and he found a person who created, uh, founded a, a, a production company with the uh, neighbors in the, in the slum to uh, to facilitate the, the extras for the um, movie movie production in, in, in Argentina and movies and television and he has a statement <coughs> um, uh, in Argentina most of the uh, movies at that time because the, the crisis was terrible uh, uh, most of the movies or TV shows um, shows the the, uh, the, man, the poor people in the street because the poor people was very visible for the first time uh, after the crisis. So um, um, the, 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 this reality appears in television in the, the movies. So. Um, the, this guy in the slum said, well, the, the industry, the, the movie industry needs poor people, needs pe people from the slum. We can do it. Um, so they, uh, he, he founded this uh, casting company to um, work with the neighbors. But uh, he, he decided to make uh, his own movies. He said, well, we, we can do uh, a movie. And the movie is about um, aliens, extraterrestrials who <laughs> come to the, to the Earth. And he said, I, I saw, I, I, well, I don't know why, where, but I, I, I watch a lot of uh, movies where the, the um, aliens go to the rich people houses. Why not uh, <laughs> think that the uh, aliens can come to the to the 
slums. Uh, so he decided to Hollywood uh, 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 movie because the interesting is not just the, 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 the idea of the movie, but he um, negotiated uh, with the with the the big industry. He he tried to compete with the Hollywood production uh, because <coughs> the, the, the topic is the aliens coming to the slum. So <laughs> and obviously the slum, the neighbors uh, uh, fight uh, against the aliens and uh, liberate the, the world of the, <laughs> of the uh, 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 invasion. So um, I, I think that the, the, the two projects are very connected with, um, um, the, with, with not just the culture in, in the traditional sense, but the movies, the television, and the, the, the material um, way in, in which uh, one can participate in the society. Yeah, those are really interesting examples, and I'm sure we find a lot of synergy in terms of production from um, a lot of neighborhoods uh, who are uh, classified as either poor neighborhoods or low-income neighborhoods. And very often when we think of contemporary art, uh, when we think of what is the contemporary, it's almost juxtaposed almost against the traditional. And those that are supposed to be traditional, the rural poor, tribal art, tribal culture, are almost not considered in the contemporary, right? So the contemporary is somehow um, urban middle classes. The urban poor occupy an odd space. They're almost considered acultural, you know, in that sense, that they are living, they're not the romanticized, um, you know, spaces of the rural, the bucolic, or the forest, the tribal. But the urban, which is uh, in our backyards, is almost a place of squalor, of debasement, of uh, unwanted, uh, you know, spaces which could then be, which could be ours in our sense, it's too close to home. So we haven't yet found a space to museumize it or romanticize it. And I think this is one of the big challenges of arguing for cultural production that's contemporaneous, that's different. Um, you talked in your article about, it's not always about opposition to power. It's, and in this a film example, Yes, uh, this, this is the interesting thing, um, uh, is uh, the, these uh, people uh, want to, to make, um, make things, uh, make uh, books, make a movie, or uh, intervene in the, in the public scene, but not just, um, uh, I, I think that the, the, the um, um, it, Something emancipatory is are in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in this uh, project is is the, the way in way in which they empower them uh, uh, because um, uh, I, unfortunately most of the people uh, belongs to the slum forever in Argentina because it's. Uh, the, the situation is not very good, so um, they um, <coughs> decided to. Um, um, I, I think uh, they, they tried to um, looking for ways to uh, in, uh, integrate uh, their work in uh, relationship with the. the um, more uh, traditional uh, practices, cultural practices. Uh, so this uh, is my, my, my view, and it's not uh, uh, against the power, but try to negotiate with the power, you know, because this is the, 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 the idea of the movie. Uh, it's uh, not about the, the uh, people of the club. Is about the, the uh, aliens, but it's about the people of the, the, the Sudan also, but uh, they use the um, cultural, um, symbolic um, 
the narrative of the, the, the enemy who uh, invade the terrors to empower the people. We can uh, um, expose the aliens, uh, kill all the aliens with the um, terrible water of the Islam. <laughs> they water, and the water is uh, terrible, so the, the aliens die. So, uh, this, this kind of negotiation power is not uh, uh, we, we uh, as a uh, essence or uh, identity, but we, we are in the world, so we have to negotiate. Yeah, I, mean, I want to talk a little bit about the digital space since uh, you know, using the digital medium um, is so much part of this exhibition. And um, you know, when we think of the digital space, in, you know, does it provide an, uh, a democratic experience? Is it an equalizer or is it very exclusive and, and perpetuates the boundaries? So what has been your experience, Anika? So, <clears throat> I think the... <coughs> Currently, the uh, digital space remains mostly for those who can access it. And that access, at least today in India, is mostly in the metro cities or frontier cities. But uh, with the help of uh, IIT Bombay, Dukaran is doing a, a different experience in uh, 19 tribal villages in Baika. And uh, IIT Bombay managed to get uh, internet to these villages where uh, we have created a team of about <coughs> close to 18 <coughs> in Seva, which is the <coughs> evolution of our barefoot researchers. And with the help of uh, training that they have been given by uh, Mukarji, they are now trying to help the villagers access many tribal schemes, specifically meant for tribals, at their doorsteps with the help of internet access. But this is a, a, a small uh, product and uh, we are hoping that at the end of our project, we will be able to take this data to the policy makers and to say this is a model which is successful and can we scale it up with the the government to the entire uh, district. Um, just to linger on the digital, I think that one of the things that we observed, you know, when we were working on the, in the digital space, and the assumption is that you just basically need a functional literacy, and you, you as a digital native or a citizen, we do the most utilitarian things and will watch only what you need. And there's, and this is a process again in your research work that there is no critical thinking or no critical analysis that's required, no right, you know, no pondering whether the right to freedom of expression is an important part of it or not. And I think uh, what's been very interesting to me about the work um, you know, with Pukar is really looking at the debates and the dialogues um, about what is the past that I have had the privilege also to have, and I've seen you all having them, Shutika and the rest of you, about what does it mean to do this research? What does it mean to have a PowerPoint? Or what does it mean to have this digital space? So this more critical literacy rather than this very functional, instrumental, uh, literacy, I think, has been a very powerful part of your work. And uh, um, and looking at the technological space is both, um, in, and looking at the idea of the museum, uh, not to just celebrate what is lost or not to just memorialize what is lost and not to look at it as uh, something that is erased from our histories and can only linger in the form of a museum. So the museum carries with it that, right, that we, we, we go to museums with that sense of uh, loss, to experience it because we don't experience it in everyday reality. So it's both a tragic for us in some ways to have the mill lands as a museum. And yet at the same time, if you don't have an investment or if you don't look at the contributions of communities um, to the city, uh, then how do you remember? And whose, whose memories uh, are then Im immortalized or whose memories become powerful and shape the future of cities. So I think this dilemma is always reflected um, you know, in whatever form of uh, artistic capture or in whatever form of research capture of those 
uh, communities which are struggling uh, to, to have claim to the space in a city. And I think what kind of urban futures do we want to have and will they be inclusive or will they be exclusive? And I think what kinds of cultural practices do we want to have and will those be inclusive or will those be exclusive? I think these are some of the very challenging and poignant questions that uh, Pukhar's work and all your work raises. And, um, and, uh, and the exhibition then is not a neat answer to a very, you know, it, it's not a packed technological answer to a community. It, it's, a provo it's a provocation. It's a way to look at it and to, to even as a voyeur, we are part, and as, as citizens of Bombay, to understand our own implications in those histories of erasure.